The meadow's biome is the first of six biomes currently in Valheim. It is characterized by green grassy fields, melodic music, and relative safety in contrast to the others. In this video, I will share with you a full guide to the meadows and cover the following. Key resources in the meadows biome, all of the meadows creatures, a complete list of armors and weapons, how to find and prepare for the meadows boss, and of course, there will be some tips, tricks, and secrets along the way. When starting a new world, you will land amongst six sacrificial stones. First thing you want to do is interact with the stone to highlight the meadows boss location on your map, Etir. Defeating him is your main objective in the meadows, but before we fight him, we need to prepare. The first thing you'll want to do is build a base for shelter. To do this, you'll need to first build a hammer, followed by a crafting table. Pick up wood and stone found around the ground to get started. As you progress, you'll gain the ability to craft an axe and cut down trees. In the meadows, there are three types of trees. First are beech trees. You can cut these down with the stone axe, which yields you wood, and more rarely, resin, feathers, and beech seeds. The second tree is the oak tree, which can only be cut down with a bronze axe or better. And, like the beech trees, yield wood, resin, and feathers, but also fine wood and potentially an acorn. Thirdly, the birch tree, which, like the oak tree, can only be cut down with a bronze axe or better, and will yield you wood, fine wood, with a chance of resin, feathers, and birch seed. You won't have the ability to craft the bronze axe until you advance to the black forest biome, but there is a way to chop these trees down early. If there are beech trees in the vicinity of the oak or birch tree you want to destroy, you can chop down those beech trees and hope they fall in your tree of interest. If you're lucky, this will destroy the tree. With shelter secured, your next priority will be to find food to build up your health and stamina. You can get access to food by slaying several creatures in the meadows. First is the boar. Hunting the boar is relatively easy as it will aggro you on sight. Slaying the boar will yield you boar meat and leather scraps and potentially the boar trophy. Second is the neck. Necks are usually found near the water and similar to the boar will aggro you on sight. Slay the necks to receive the neck tail and rarely the neck trophy. Lastly, the deer. Deers are skittish and will run from you on sight. You can hunt deer in several different ways. Use your sneak ability to sneak up on them. Craft a bow or a spear and shoot at them from range. Use the crafting station method to trap and kill the deer. Or you can just get lucky like I do sometimes and hope they get stuck in a tree or in the water. Killing deer will yield you deer hide, deer meat, and a chance at a deer trophy. In addition, you'll also find other food sources you can gather such as raspberries found in bushes or mushrooms scattered on the ground. Pro tip, turn down the foliage quality in your menus to make these easier to spot. And lastly, honey from bees nests which can be found in huts like this. Beware as these can be dangerous and very easily kill you in the early game. Either shoot them from afar with a bow or build a crafting station nearby and deconstruct the building supporting the bees to destroy the nest. Much of the food you have gathered can be eaten raw and others like the boar and deer meat must be cooked. To cook your food, build a bonfire and place a cooking station over top. Place your meat on the cooking station and shortly you'll have a cooked meal. With shelter secured and a full belly, it's time to prepare for combat by crafting armor and weapons. There are two sets of armor to be crafted in the meadows. The rag armor, made up of the rag tunic and rag pants, can be crafted with leather scraps found from boars. And second, the leather armor, the first real armor set in Valheim. This armor set is composed of the leather helmet, leather tunic, leather pants, and deer hide cape. To craft and fully upgrade the leather armor, you'll need to gather deer hide, bone fragments from stone graves and viking graveyards. Stone graves and viking graveyards can sometimes be hard to recognize but take special notice of rock formations such as these shown on screen. Dig in these locations to find treasures such as the bone fragments, in addition to amber pearls, coins, fire arrows, rubies, or even a silver necklace. Alternatively, you can sneak ahead into the black forest and battle some skeletons for bone fragments. As for weapons and shields, you have an absolute abundance of options. I'll include a full list of weapons and shields on screen as well as their crafting costs. Feel free to pause here to read the full list. I would personally recommend the stone axe and crude bow for slaying the hostile creatures in the meadows, 
like the Grayling and ultimately Aether, keep in mind that to use the bow you need arrows. You can make the basic arrows with only wood, but if you want to seriously pack a punch, you'll need feathers, flint, and resin to create flint and fire arrows. Get resin, you can kill graylings, or if you're lucky, you'll get resin from cutting down trees. Flint can be found on the ground, primarily near water. And finally, you can shoot gulls to claim their feathers. You'll see gulls flying around quite often, but you'll likely have to wait for them to land. Once they do, you can kill them with a well-placed arrow or spear toss. Now you're ready to fight the boss. To prepare, I recommend crafting and upgrading the leather armor set, crafting the stone axe and crude bow with fire arrows, sleep or rest at a fire to gain the rested bonus for increased health and stamina regeneration, and finally, eat my recommended meal of cooked deer meat, cooked boar meat, and honey for a good balance of health and stamina for the fight. All that is left to do is navigate to Aether's summoning location and place two deer trophies on the forsaken altar to initiate the fight. Once defeated, Aether will drop the Aether Trophy and Hard Antler. Use the Hard Antler at a crafting table to craft the Antler Pickaxe, which will be critical for progression in the Black Forest. And lastly, place the Aether Trophy on its corresponding sacrificial stone where you spawned at the beginning of the game to unlock his Forsaken Power. This power will allow you to reduce stamina costs of running and jumping by 60% for a few minutes. The Black Forest biome contains the item that will act as the jumping board for the endless possibilities that Valheim provides. Follow me on my adventure through the Black Forest as I share with you how to find and use that special item as I do my best Dwarven Minor impression, Wake the Dead, do battle with Shrek's blue cousin, Surprise, find our new friendly best friend, and overcome the king of the forest. All of which will lead us to the key material enabling us to ascend out of the stone age and accelerate our travels across Valheim's massive world. The first thing you will need to do is craft the antler pickaxe using the antler acquired from defeating the meadows boss Ikthir. Once crafted, equip your leather armor and favorite weapon and set your sights on finding tin and copper ore. Tin will predominantly be found along water sources in small chunks whereas copper can be found amongst the trees in concentrated blocks. Tin will enable us to craft the cauldron, unlocking more advanced food recipes while copper unlocks the forge crafting station. The forge will allow us to take our weapons and armor to the next level. However, the creatures in the Black Forest are highly sensitive to sound and likely will not let the clink and clank of our pickaxe go unnoticed. Grey Dwarf Brutes, Shamans, and the standard Grey Dwarfs call this biome home. These creatures will drop key resources like resin and Grey Dwarf eyes, and more importantly, the Brutes specifically can drop ancient seeds. I will expand on the importance of these seeds later in this video. Like their Grey Dwarf counterparts, trolls will also be attracted to the sounds you make navigating the biome, or can be found protecting or even inside their caves. They are slow and lumbering but can really pack a punch. As you learn their attack patterns, you can turn the trolls into excavators by dodging their attacks to help accelerate your mining. Once defeated, they will drop Troll Leather Hide. This hide can be used to craft the Black Forest's version of Light Armor. The Troll Hide Armor set is the first in Valheim to provide a set bonus. Equipping all four pieces will provide you with plus 15 to your sneak skill, maximizing your damage to snuck up upon targets. With your pockets now full of tin and copper ore, you might notice you did not unlock any new crafting recipes. To make the ore usable, you will first need to smelt it. To do that, we must first wake the dead by diving into the Black Forest's instanced dungeons. Burial chambers predominantly take two shapes, the first being an easily identifiable rectangular rock formation, while the second may be harder to spot consisting of sloped or flat earth leading to a cave or hole in the ground. A clear indicator that you are near a chamber would be the presence of skeletons as they always protect the dungeon entrances. Inside you will find more skeletons, ghosts, and more rarely rancid remains. As you navigate their narrow passageways you'll find loot in chests such as feathers and arrows but also valuables such as coins, amber, and rubies. The amber and rubies will have great value to our new friend that I will introduce to you later in this video. Additionally, 
If you're lucky, you'll find a rune stone that provides you the location of the Black Forest boss. These are not guaranteed, so keep in mind you may have to clear several dungeons before finding the rune stone. With all that said, it is time I reveal the real reason we are here. Burial chambers possess the invaluable Sertling cores. The heat within these cores enable the recipes for the charcoal kiln, smelter, and the secret device that will accelerate your exploration to light speed. If you stick with me to the end of the video, I will tell you everything you need to know about it. With the kiln, you can convert wood to charcoal and use that charcoal to smelt copper and tin at the smelter. From there, you may combine the copper and tin into bronze, granting you recipes for the full bronze armor set, plus a suite of lethal weapons. I will leave a full breakdown of all bronze armor and weapons on screen for your benefit. Feel free to pause the video here. At this stage, we are ready to hunt down the king of the forest, but before we do, I must first share with you the other resources available in the biome and introduce you to our new best friend. The Black Forest introduces a new type of wood not present in the meadows. Poor wood can be acquired from chopping down pine trees. Poor wood will unlock recipes for both the cultivator, bronze pickaxe, and the much improved fine wood bow. Along the floor of the biome, you'll come across new food ingredients such as thistle, blueberries, and also carrot seeds. With carrot seeds and the cultivator, you may now begin a carrot garden in the meadows biome. I'll leave a full list of food recipes you will have unlocked by progressing the biome. Personally, I'd recommend combining the carrot soup, queen's jam, and deer stew for a good balance of health and stamina. And of course, if you have some luck, you will come across Haldor on your journey. In case you did not know, Haldor is a subscriber to the channel, and you can be too. Subscribe for easy access to more Valheim content. Haldor is a friendly merchant, allowing you to sell your valuables and purchase items of great value. I will leave a full list of his wares on screen for you to view, but I would personally recommend you purchase the Meshing Jord. This belt will increase your carrying capacity by 150 to a maximum of 450, a must need purchase. All that said, Haldor is not a guaranteed spawn and is very tricky to find. What we do know is that he must spawn at least 1500 meters away from your original spawn location, and a white bag icon will appear on your map when you come within approximately 300 to 500 meters of his location. As it turns out, this is roughly a distance equal to two lengths of your minimap. To find Haldor, I recommend following the coast of a black forest biome by boat and keep an eye on your minimap for this important white bag icon. And with that, let us hunt the Elder. Once you have identified the location of the Elder, you must gather three ancient seeds. As mentioned previously, these can drop from Grey Dwarf Brutes. Alternatively, you can farm these from destroying Grey Dwarf spawning nests. With three ancient seeds, all that is left to do is sacrifice the seeds at his altar to summon him and take him down. He has three attacks, a vine shooting ranged attack, a stomp if you get up close and personal, and thirdly, he will spawn immobile roots, which will attack you if you get too close. He is immune to poison, spirit, and stagger but weak to fire. I recommend bringing the fine bow with fire arrows and take him down at a distance. Once defeated he will drop both his trophy and the swamp key. Mount the elder trophy on his corresponding sacrificial stone to unlock his forsaken power. This power enables a 60% increase in axe damage to trees for 5 minutes for you and nearby allies. Second, the swamp key will be essential to your progress as you now turn your attention to the swamp biome. But before we finish up, let me tell you how your playthrough is forever changed after clearing this biome. Remember the Sertling cores you acquired from the burial chambers? Going forward, you can combine these with Grey Dwarf Eyes and Fine Wood to create portals. Once built, give the portal a name. If you then craft a second portal with a matching name, you effectively have fast travel in Valheim. Next time you plan on a long adventure, build a portal in your home and bring materials on your adventure to build a matching portal at your destination. This will save you an agonizingly long trip home once complete. I recommend building a dedicated portal in your home base to keep your adventures organized. With all that said, keep these two tips in mind when building portals. One, lowercase and uppercase letters matter in naming your portals. Ensure the names match down to the case of your letters. And two, remember you cannot travel through a portal with certain resources such as tin and copper ore. Any items that cannot be transferred through a portal will have an icon clearly indicating this fact and a message will display when attempting to portal with that item. Everybody knows the six major biomes in Valheim, but nobody ever wants to talk about the underappreciated ocean biome. In this video, we are going to sail and visit one of these and slay one of these together giving us the rare resources to craft unique tools and the secret and elusive shield you most certainly do not have. But before we do any of that, how are we going to get there? When you are finally ready to leave the safety of your starting island and venture into the open seas, you'll have three options to choose from. The raft, the curve, 
and the longship. Each subsequent ship increases in crafting complexity. The raft can be built simply with wood, leather scraps, and resin. The carve will require progress to the black forest, requiring bronze nails and fine wood. And finally, the longship, requiring progress to the swamp with a recipe containing iron nails. That said, with increased complexity comes great benefits with increased speed and storage. I will leave a graphic on screen with both the crafting recipes, load capacities, and speeds for each vessel so that you can be informed when choosing your ship for your own adventure. For me, I never kick off shore with anything less than the car. The Leviathan are a rare occurrence in Valheim, occurring in only 1% of each ocean zone having a depth of at least 30 meters. However, if you are lucky enough to find one, approach with caution. Do yourself a favor and dock with your boat ladder facing the Leviathan. You will thank me for this later. On the surface, the back of the Leviathan looks like a basic island with rocks and trees, but the real reason we are here is for the abyssal barnacles. To mine these, you will need a pickaxe. For that reason, you must have at least progressed past defeating the meadows boss Eichthyr before venturing out. While mining the barnacle, there is a chance you will trigger the submersion of the creature. Once triggered, you will hear a large groan. At this point, time is of the essence. Shortly after, you will hear a second groan and the leviathan will begin to shake. At this stage, you have about 10 seconds before the creature is fully submerged, so hustle back to your boat to avoid drowning. Leviathans do not ever respawn after submerging, so do your best to mine as much as you can. Finally, with the safety of having your boat under your feet, you will notice an abundance of chitin on hand from the barnacles. We will put that material to good use later, but for now, we have bigger fish to fry. Similar to the Leviathan, the Serpent is rare and hard to find, but unlike the Leviathan, the Serpent finds you. If you spend enough time in the deep water, you'll eventually be lucky, or unlucky, enough to have a Serpent spawn and attack your boat. The Serpent is more likely to spawn during rain, thunderstorms, and at night. Once attacked, tackle these creatures with arrows. They are not as fearsome as they look. Once defeated, they will drop Serpent Meat, Serpent Scale, and the Serpent Trophy. The cooked Serpent Meat and Serpent Stew are excellent early to mid-game foods derived from the Serpent's flesh and far exceed any other food up to and including the mountain's biome. Now, you might have noticed that the Serpent Scale and Trophy weren't found floating amongst the meat. As it turns out that while the meat floats, the Trophy and Scales sink. Fortunately for you, I have a solution. Remember that chitin we gathered earlier? Before we get to that, if you have enjoyed yourself or learned something new, consider leaving a like or subscribing for easy access to future Valheim content. The Chitin unlocked the recipes for both the Abyssal Razor and Abyssal Harpoon. While the Razor makes for an excellent mid-game weapon, what I truly need is the Harpoon. You can use the Harpoon to grab onto a serpent and drag them to shore. Once in shallow water, slay the serpent and claim its treasures. This time we will be able to claim the scales and trophy from the shallow water. The Serpent Scales will enable you to craft the Serpent Scale Shield. This is an excellent mid-game shield and is one of the only four ways to provide pierce resistance damage in addition to the Root Harness, Bone Mass's Forsaken Power, and while you are under the Corpse Run effect. For this reason, it is an essential tool in any player's arsenal. Lastly, the Serpent Trophy can now serve as a beautiful decoration for your home or you can combine it with Fishing Bait to create Heavy Fishing Bait. Heavy fishing bait is required for catching the tuna and coral cod in the ocean biome. There are many coveted, game-changing, busted items in Valheim. The Mejingjord belt from Haldor, the feather cape from the Mistlands, and the serpent shield from the armor of the ocean serpent, to name a few. And yet, the swamp has the highest density of any biome for broken, in-game items. Follow me as I unlock an underrated bow in the swamp's sunken crypts, acquire an endgame chest piece by defeating these monstrous creatures, and snag this biome's boss trophy for the best forsaken power in the game. But before we get into any of that, let us make sure we are properly prepared to navigate the swamp. Firstly, the swamp is dark, wet, and unforgiving. In fact, it's constantly raining in this biome and therefore you will always have the wet status effect applied to you. The wet effect will reduce your health regeneration by 20 25% and your stamina regeneration by 15%, in addition to making you weak to frost and lightning damage. Ensure you get your rested effect buff before entering the biome to counteract the wet effect. Unfortunately, you will not be able to regain your rested effect bonus after it expires while under the wet status. However, do bring materials with you to build a fire as later in this video, I will show you a tip to regain your rested effect bonus while in the swamp. Secondly, many of the swamp's creatures apply poison damage to you with their attacks and without something to counteract that effect, you will quickly perish. Fortunately, completing the black forest biome provided the recipe for the mead base for poison resistance. Craft a couple of these and use the fermenter to convert them to poison resistance meads. With a mead popped, you will take 75% reduced damage from poison for a full 10 minutes. I recommend having a full stack of 10 of these before entering the swamp. Thirdly, armor. I recommend using your best armor from the black forest, either the troll if you're looking to travel through the swamps quickly, or the bronze if you're eager for a fight. 
As per weapons, I would recommend a weapon that does blunt damage like the bronze mace. The creatures in this biome do not have many weaknesses to work with, but as you will see in the next section of this video, quite a few of them are susceptible to blunt damage. In addition, I always have a bow with you to take out creatures at a distance. I recommend taking some bronze arrows if you have them, and some fire arrows for those creatures susceptible to fire. With your rested bonus, armor, and weapons equipped, we can now work towards the first broken item in the swamp's overworld. The swamp overworld provides an abundance of resources for us to progress our games through weapons, armor, and equipment upgrades. Much of these resources are derived from the dangerous critters that call this biome home. First are the blobs and oozers. These creatures scuttle across the ground and make giant leaps in your direction to quickly close distance between you and them. Beware, as these creatures also can apply poison damage to you, so make sure you have a mead handy. Keep in mind, you cannot retroactively pop a poison mead. The mead must be active prior to the poison effect being applied to you to provide resistance. Fortunately for us, these are weak to blunt damage, so the mace I recommended earlier will come in handy. When blobs are killed, they will drop ooze and the blob trophy, while when an oozer is killed, they will spawn two additional blobs and a small chance of scrap iron. While you can get scrap iron from these creatures, they are not a reliable farming source. I will show you how to reliably get scrap iron in the next section of this video. Second are the Draugrs and Draugr Elites. These creatures are undead vikings and can either have melee or ranged weapons with no real weaknesses to speak of. The elites are stronger versions of the base Draugr and when defeated they can drop entrails and their corresponding trophy. The entrails unlock a nice new health food recipe, while the Draugr Elite Trophy is part of a unique melee weapon. I will ensure to brief you on all of the weapons and food recipes you will have unlocked in the swamp later in this video. Third are leeches. Leeches can be found swimming in the shallow water across the biome. Like the blobs and oozers, they do apply poison damage but are relatively low health. Killing them provides you with blood bags and the leech trophy. Next are certlings and wraiths, which are the rarest of spawns in the biome. Wraiths will only spawn at night. These can be airborne and weak to fire. This is where those fire arrows can come in handy. Once defeated, they will drop Chain and the Wraith Trophy. You will need Chain for the upgraded cooking station and for upgrading your forge. Certlings, on the other hand, only spawn near flame geysers and are a rare spawn in themselves. If one has spawned, you will have a hard time missing the sight of flames. Certlings will hurl fireballs at you, but the good thing about constantly being wet is that you are resistant to fire damage. Defeating these will give you coal, certling cores, and rarely the certling trophy. Farming certlings near these geysers make for an excellent certling core farm. And I should mention, you will also find skeletons across this biome, which you will be familiar with after clearing the Black Forest biome. They can be found randomly standing around or more dangerously by evil bone pile spawners. Clear these ASAP to avoid being mobbed by skeletons. Before I get into the final creature holding the key to crafting this broken chest piece, I need to first cover other key resources not obtained from creatures in the swamp. First, the swamp introduces a new type of tree and wood in ancient trees. Chopping down these trees with at least a bronze axe yields ancient bark, which will be a critical ingredient in crafting swamp weapons and armor. Second, you can acquire turnip seeds from yellow flowers found rarely on the swamp floor. Combine these seeds with the cultivator to start a turnip farm in the meadows. Now, without further ado, the final creature in the swamp to conquer is the almighty Abomination. Abominations emerge from what can be mistaken as a stump when you encroach on their territory. While intimidating, they are relatively easy to parry and susceptible to fire damage. Slash damage works best, so either slash away with a sword or take them down at a distance with fire arrows. Defeating Abominations provides you with their trophy, guck, and root. Root in particular enables crafting of the Root Armor Set and my first broken item, the Root Harness Chest Piece. This chest piece is one of the only methods and the only wearable item to provide resistance to damage from pierce attacks. This resistance is truly broken for the swamp and into endgame biomes like the plains and even the mistlands. Creatures throughout these biomes do a ton of pierce damage. For this reason, the Root Harness is a critical component of my recommended endgame armor and you get it only halfway through the game, truly busted. On top of that, the Root Mask also provides poison resistance. As a result, if you equip the mask, you will no longer have need of poison resistance meads. Before we dive into the sunken crypts and explore my second broken item, I should mention that guck obtained from abominations can also be mined from guck sacks found on trees. Simply mine or chop them off the tree to obtain guck. Sunken crypts are the swamp's dungeons and are gated rectangular stone structures with green glowing torches, making them easily identifiable. To enter these crypts, you will need the swamp key, which you should have acquired following defeating the elder in the black forest. Pro tip, as you will notice when entering the crypts, you can finally take a break from the wet effect. Seize this as an opportunity to craft a fire in the crypt entrance to regain your rested effect buff. Inside, you will find familiar creatures such as draugrs, draugr elites, blobs, 
and body piles, which will periodically summon Draugrs. Make sure you clear these quickly before getting overwhelmed. However, the reason we are here is to mine the mud piles blocking the passageways within the dungeon. Mining these piles will provide us with scrap iron, leather scraps, and withered bones. Search the chests within crypts for large piles of scrap iron, more withered bones, and valuables like rubies. Withered bones will come in handy as I will describe later in this video, but the true treasure here is the scrap iron. Refining the scrap at a smelter will yield iron, bringing us into the Iron Age, unlocking a ton of weapons, armor, and tools. I will share the full list of new weapons and armor unlocked in the swamp biome on screen now, so feel free to pause the video here. Included in these unlocks is what I consider to be the second broken item provided by the swamp and what many consider to be the best bow in Valheim in the Huntsman bow. Let me explain. While doing less damage than late game bows in the Draugr Fang and Spine Snap bows, it has a much lower stamina cost for use with 8 stamina per second compared to 10 and 14 from the Draugr and Spine Snap. That said, where the Huntsman truly shines is its attack and hit radius being 4 meters compared to 15 and 8 on the other two bows. What this means is that using this bow and hitting enemies with it does not draw the attention of other creatures as easily, enabling you to isolate enemies with ease. This is best illustrated by attacking a herd of loxes in the plains. As you can see, you can draw the attention of a single lox with the Huntsman that is simply not possible with any other bow. And with that, we can turn our attention to our third and final broken item acquired by defeating the swamp's boss. First off, take a moment to review the full list of food recipes unlocked in the swamp so you can be best prepared for the fight. With optimal food in your belly, we need to first find the location of our boss. The runestone providing bone mass's location can often be found within sunken crypts or within ruined structures across the overworld. Once his location is identified, grab your rested effect bonus, craft some poison resistance meads, equip your best armor, I recommend iron if you've crafted it, and lastly, I recommend again a blunt weapon like the iron mace or iron sledge. Bone mass is resistant resistant to slash, fire, and pierce, and immune to poison and stagger. Fortunately, he does have a weakness to blunt and frost. For this reason, your best bet for defeating bone mass is up close and personal with a blunt weapon. His forsaken altar is super cool, highlighted by a massive skull filled with acid. To summon him, you'll need to bring with you 10 withered bones to sacrifice. But before summoning him, I do recommend you raise the earth around his spawn location, especially if there's a lot of water around, as fighting in water is no fun at all. Once summoned, he has three attacks. First, a simple melee attack when up close. Second, an area of effect attack, which summons a green gas cloud causing poison damage. And finally, he will occasionally throw a glob of goop that will spawn up to four random creatures. Once defeated, Bowmass will drop the Wishbone and Bowmass's trophy. His trophy is the third broken item provided by the swamp as when attached to his corresponding sacrificial stone unlocks his forsaken power. This forsaken power gives you and nearby players 50 to 75 percent reduced damage from blunt, slash, and pierce damage for five minutes. Damage reduction is absolutely busted and is my go-to forsaken power even deep into the mistlands. For this reason, I think it's completely broken. And lastly, as you turn your attention towards the next biome, the wishbone will be critical in progressing your game through the mountains. The mountains biome is the most uninviting and dangerous region in Valheim. With its freezing temperatures, starving and relentless creatures, and deep, dark, and dangerous but rewarding dungeons, you will be pushed to your limit. Follow me on your adventure through this biome as we clash with wolves, mine for hidden treasures, conquer the Valheim's most dangerous but rewarding frost caves, and defeat this biome's terrifying bots. First things first, let's make sure we're ready to enter the mountains. The mountains biome is the first and only in Valheim to add temperature effects. Without the proper preparation, as you enter the snowy mountains, you will fall under the freezing effect. With this effect applied, you won't last long as you will receive 100% reduced health regeneration and a 60% reduction in stamina regeneration, in addition to taking one damage per second to your health. Fortunately for us, we have a way to prevent this status effect from being applied. Frost resistance meads, when consumed, provide resistance to freezing for 10 minutes. To craft the frost resistance mead, first cook the mead base for frost resistance at a cauldron and place the base into a fermenter. You will have unlocked the fermenter recipe following the swamp biome. I recommend crafting a handful of these as you'll likely want to be prepared for an adventure lasting longer than the 10 minute duration of a single mead. The meads fortunately stack to a quantity of 10. With your meads in hand, equip your best swamp weapons and armor to face the biome. If you are interested in recommendations, I would recommend the full iron armor set for maximum protection. You could include the root harness chest piece, but pierce damage isn't as prevalent in this biome as others, so it might be best to simply maximize armor in this case. As for weapons, any of the iron weapons will do for melee, so simply choose your favorite. I do recommend, however, that you bring the Huntsman Bow and craft fire and poison arrows, as many of the creatures are vulnerable to either fire or poison. 
Before we get into the mountain's expansive dungeons, let's first jump into the mountain's overworld. The mountain's overworld is barren and unforgiving and susceptible to blinding snowstorms. Our main objective here will be to use the wishbone to find hidden treasures beneath the ground surface. Before we do that, you will need to be prepared for the lethal creatures you will encounter. First are wolves. Wolves often travel in packs and will attack you in quick succession, really draining your stamina. If you can, try to isolate them with a bow or take them down from a distance. Beware. If you do hear them howl, they may be calling for their friends for backup. Do your best to kill them quickly before they recruit their pals. Once defeated, they will drop the wolf fang, meat, pelt, and most rarely, their trophy. These items will be used in creating more advanced foods and armor as we will discuss later in the video. Next are drakes, which are airborne dragons who fire frost damaging projectiles. You will find these creatures often protecting glowing pink orbs. These orbs are critical for your mountain's progression, which I will cover in detail in the final section of this video. That said, you will know a drake is nearby when you hear their shriek. Fortunately, they are easy to defeat with a bow and specifically with fire arrows as they are weak to fire. Once defeated, they will drop the drake trophy and freeze glands. As like the wolf, the items dropped by the drake will be used later in weapons and food recipes. Thirdly, our stone golems, which when approached, will emerge from the ground, often mistaken for rocks. These behemoths pack a punch, so be very careful. They have a major weakness to pickaxe damage, so if you can find the room, hit them with a well-timed pickaxe swing. Once overcome, they will drop crystal, stone, and rarely the stone golem trophy. Crystal is mostly used in decorative construction, but is an ingredient in one specific weapon. And the final creature native to the overworld are the Fenring. Fenring are unique in that they exclusively spawn at night. Be wary of their leap attack, which can quickly close the distance between you and them. And, like the wolves, they may howl to summon reinforcements. Like many of the mountain's creatures, they are weak to fire, so try some fire arrows or even a torch to light them up. After falling, they will drop a wolf fang and possibly the Fenring trophy. With an understanding of the threats within the biome, we can now begin our search for treasure. Equip the wishbone and you will notice an audio and visual pinging effect emitting from your character. The frequency and strength of this pinging will increase as you get closer to treasures. Navigate around the biome until you find a spot where it starts pinging like crazy. This is your signal to dig. Before digging, if you happen to see a ruin or cabin on your quest, search it for chests. Within these chests, you will have a chance to find onion seeds. Onion seeds can be planted in the meadows to grow onions, a very useful food recipe ingredient. In addition, as you are crossing the barrens of the mountains, keep your eyes open for obsidian deposits. Quickly mine these for obsidian for the creation of obsidian arrows. These arrows will be invaluable for us as I will explain later in this video. Now back to digging. You should shortly find a silver vein. There is a chance your wishbone detected a silver necklace or some skeletal remains, which can be disappointing. Oh dude, we found treasure. Holy fuck, what is treasure? but this is rare. One trick I do recommend in excavating the silver vein completely until the vein is not touching any other piece of ground. At this point, when you smash it with your iron pickaxe, the entire vein will crumble. Take your silver ore back to a smelter and voila, you have silver. Silver unlocks a plethora of weapons and the wolf armor set and wolf fur cape. I will leave a full list of weapons and armor you will unlock in this biome on screen. You may notice I did exclude one excellent armor set that we will unlock following our adventures in the frost caves coming in the next section of this video. And lastly, take note of the wolf fur cape and wolf armor chest. Each of these items, when worn, provide resistance to frost damage. As a result, when one of these items are worn, you no longer need to have a frost mead popped to survive in the mountains. With the overworld explored, let's Let's dive into the mountain's deep, dark, and most importantly, rewarding dungeons. The Frost Cave's entrances can be hard to spot as they blend in with the mountain's rocky terrain. These caves do present a challenge but also provide worthwhile rewards. Ensure you are properly equipped before entering. At this stage, you will have unlocked an abundance of new food recipes. Check out my full list of mountain's food recipes before diving in to maximize your survivability. Inside, you will be faced with a sheet of glass which can easily be meleeed down. Inside, you will find an abundance of dangerous creatures. Ghouls have low health but often travel in packs. They have heavy resistance to fire but are weak to poison. The frost caves is where your poison arrows will come in handy. Once defeated, they will drop the wolf fang and ghoul trophy. Second are bats which are more a nuisance than anything. Swat them down for leather scraps. And thirdly, are the cultists. Cultists are fire casters which can pack a punch and are immune to fire damage. Like the ooles, they are weak to poison. Defeating them yields the red jute and rarely the cultist trophy. The jute can be used to craft decorations for your home and the trophy is a critical armor component ingredient we will touch on shortly. Before getting into the juiciest loot in the frost caves, I want to first highlight three lesser known tips you could benefit from while navigating the cave. First, both the iron doors and braziers can be broken for iron and bronze respectively. Second, instead of picking the crystals from from the dungeon's walls, 
break them with a sword or bow. This yields more crystal than simply picking. And thirdly, and vastly more rare, you can find a fishing rod in a frost cave if you have not been lucky enough to find Haldor. While these spawns are exceedingly rare, a big open frozen lake can spawn within a frost cave where you will find a runestone and a fishing rod next to a poor viking's skeleton remains. But beware, as these are protected by a stone golem. As you venture deeper into the frost caves, you will start to find Fenris hair either on pedestals or draped over wooden structures. The Fenris hair is the final and most important ingredient you will need to craft my personal favorite armor set in the game, the Fenris armor. This is the only armor to give a speed boost in addition to a set bonus yielding fire resistance and additional points to your fist skill. Combine this armor set with the flesh rippers for major damage. While we turn our focus to the mountains biome, I will leave the recipes and upgrade costs for both the Fenris armor and flesh rippers on screen for your information. To summon the boss, you will first need to find their runestone to highlight their location on your map. These are usually found inside ruined structures across the overworld of the map or less frequently can be found within frost caves. Remember those glowing pink orbs we saw earlier protected by drakes? Those are dragon eggs. After you have her location, you will need to collect three of these eggs to summon motor. These cannot be transported through portals and each egg weighs 200 weight, so you'll either need a friend to help carry them for you or do so in a couple trips. When you're ready for combat, travel to her location and place three of her eggs in each of the altar slots to begin the fight. Motor has three major attacks. First, a barrage while she is in flight. Okay, he's duking me out. I think we're gonna avoid this. Or, or just get fucking smoked by it. Okay. <laughs> Second, a melee attack while she is grounded, where she will swipe, claw, or bite you. And thirdly, a breath attack, also while she is grounded, launching a blizzard-like blast of breath doing frost in addition to chop and pickaxe damage. Motor is immune to frost, spirit, and stagger, so I do not recommend bringing a weapon that does frost damage like the Frostner. But she is weak to fire, like many other mountain creatures, so fire arrows are welcome. In general, you will want to wear the highest tier armor available to you and bring a strong bow as motor will take flight and otherwise be out of range. Fire arrows will be strong due to her weakness to fire, but I generally would go with obsidian arrows as their base damage exceeds the benefit of capitalizing on motor's weakness to fire. Lastly, wolves, benrings, and drakes can and will spawn throughout the fight to complicate things. For this reason, I do recommend you complete the fight during the day for reduced add spawns. Once defeated, Motor will drop her trophy and the Dragon Tear. Mount her trophy on the corresponding sacrificial stone to gain her Forsaken Power. This Forsaken Power will assist significantly on your boning adventures going forward, forcing exclusive Tailwinds while sailing for a duration of 5 minutes. And secondly, the Dragon Tear provides the recipe for the Artisan Table. The Artisan Table will enable you to craft the refining equipment used for the resources you will soon be gathering in the plains as you turn your direction towards that biome. The Plains biome is the fifth of six biomes in the current build of Valheim. The plains are characterized by large open areas with rolling hills and fields of yellow grass filled with many of the varied and most dangerous creatures in the game. In this video, I will share with you a guide to every creature in the biome, show you where to find and how to best use the critical resources provided by the plains, and finally, how to find, prepare for, and defeat the plains' deadly boss, who in my opinion is the most challenging boss in Valheim. But before we get into any of that, we first need to ensure we are prepared to navigate the plains by covering my recommended armor, weapons, and food. Firstly, for protection, you truly only have two armor sets to consider. However, if you bear with me, I will show you one sneaky modification I do recommend you make for whichever armor you ultimately choose. That said, your two options are the Fenris armor or the wolf armor. Both of these armors are acquired in the mountains biome and each have their own pros and cons. The Fenris armor provides a total of 9% increased movement speed, and if you consider the minus 10% movement speed you would get from the wolf armor set, you will be moving a whopping 19% faster in the Fenris compared to the wolf. On top of that, the Fenris also provides fire resistance, which you will be really happy you have when dealing with the spellcasting enemies you'll encounter as I'll later cover in this video. That said, there's no comparing the difference in armor you will receive by going with the wolf armor set. The fully upgraded wolf armor will give you 78 armor compared to just 48 from the fully upgraded Fenris. It'll be up to you to decide if you prefer to be tanky or quick. 
And before moving on to my recommended weapons and food for the biome, remember that modification I referenced? The root armor offers a unique benefit that should be considered. The root harness chest piece provides resistance to pierce. Pierce damage is very common in the plains, especially from Despitos, who will very likely welcome you with one of their stings as you enter the plains. With the root harness, you will be able to tank their stings. Make sure you kill these as they drop needles and rarely the Desquito trophy. The needles can be used to craft excellent arrows. For this reason, I strongly suggest you swap the chest piece of the armor of your choice with the root harness. As for weapons, I cannot recommend the frost near enough. It is one of the best weapons in the game, giving you frost, blunt, and spirit damage. If you prefer range, nothing tops the Draugr Fang. Combine it with poison arrows for maximum effect. Finally, you want to ensure you're using the optimal food choices to maximize your survivability. Like the armor, you'll have a couple of options based on if you prefer to be tanky or a bit more nimble. If you prefer additional health, I recommend you eat ice cream, wolf skewers, and sausages. The ice cream will give you a nice stamina boost while the wolf skewer and sausages will give your health a serious bump. Alternatively, for those looking for increased stamina, you can replace the sausages with onion soup, giving you additional stamina at the expense of health. Lastly, if you happen to have serpent meat from your adventures on the open seas, you can replace the wolf skewer with cooked serpent meat, or better yet, serpent stew, to give yourself an even larger health boost. Before we move on to discuss our main target for the plains biome, I will leave the full list of foods I have mentioned here and their stats so that you can make an informed decision for yourself. Your main objective of the plains will be conquering fueling villages. These will be hard to miss, consisting of a series of structures in proximity and often huge bonfires easily seen, especially at night. Taking down these villages will allow you to acquire three key resources, enabling you to progress your game further through new armor, tools, weapons, and food. Do not worry, I will cover these resources in detail in part four of this video. Defending the villages, you'll find fuelings, fueling shamans, and worst of all, fueling berserkers. Fuelings will be armed with either swords or spears and be be careful as they can pack a punch, especially if they swarm you. Do your best to isolate them and pick them off one by one. Once defeated, they will yield black metal scrap, coins, and potentially the feeling trophy. Next are the feeling shamans, which are the fire-wielding spellcasters I referenced earlier. These will hurl fireballs at you and summon shields to protect themselves. When approaching a fueling village, I typically try and pick them off with well-placed arrows before engaging the rest of the village. The shamans will drop black metal scrap, buke berries, coins, and more rarely, the feeling shaman trophy. Lastly, and most dangerous, are the feeling berserkers. These behemoths will easily one or two hit you depending on your armor of choice. It's imperative you fight these in isolation, either take them down with arrows or tactical parries and patience. Defeating these will provide you with black metal scrap, coins, the fueling totem, more on these in part 5 of the video, and very rarely the fueling berserker trophy. Now that you have finally cleared the village of enemies, search the area for any crops that might be growing. If you are lucky, you'll find either flax or barley. Flax and barley are very important resources that we will cover in part 4 in detail. And lastly, make sure you search any chests in the area. The chests may contain more black metal scrap, but most importantly, a sharpening stone. The sharpening stone will enable you to build the grinding wheel, the final upgrade piece for the forge. Before I explain the resources we've gathered at the Fueling Village, I need to first cover two other creatures you're going to find in the plains. First, loxes are giant, furry, bison-like creatures roaming the plains chowing down on cloudberries and often found in groups of two or three. You cannot take these lightly as they pack a punch and have a ton of health. I would recommend slowly taking these down with arrows until you figure out their parry timing. Once killed, they will grant you lox meat, lox pelt, and the lox trophy. The lox meat will be a critical food item for your foreseeable future even into the mislands, and the lox pelts will unlock the lox cape crafting recipe. Secondly, you might encounter large pools of tar where the growths can be found. These resemble the blobs from the swamp but are much more dangerous. They will shoot tar at you and if hit, will apply both a poison and slow effect. If you aggro a few of these at a time and get hit, godspeed. However, if you can defeat them, they will give you tar and the growth trophy. Once clear, dig a channel to allow the tar to drain from the pit, enabling you to retrieve the tar and other items trapped within it. Tar will enable you to build nice furniture such as the hot tub, long heavy table, and black metal chest, amongst other things. Black metal scrap, barley, and flax are the key resources from the plains you will need to advance your game through food, armor, and weapons. Having defeated Modor in the mountains, you will have obtained the Dragon Tier, enabling you to build the Artisan Table. With the Artisan Table, you can now build the Blast Furnace, Windmill, and Spinning Wheel, 
or refining these resources. Smelt your black metal scraps into black metal, grind your barley into barley flour, and spin the flax into linen thread. With both black metal and linen thread, you'll be able to craft the padded armor set and black metal weapons and tools. I'll leave the full table on screen of the padded armor and black metal weapons and tools and their crafting recipes, so feel free to pause the video here. Finally, with barley flour on hand, you will have unlocked a pile of mega foods, such as the lox meat pie, composed of lox meat, cloud berries, and barley flour, fish wraps, composed of cooked fish and barley flour, blood pudding, made of thistle, blood bags, and again, barley flour, and finally, bread made of bread dough derived from barley flour. Keep in mind, many of these will have to be baked in the stone oven before eaten, so make sure you craft one of those first. I will leave the full list of foods I have mentioned here and their stats so that you can make an informed decision for yourself. All right, with black metal armor, weapons, and high level foods, we are now ready to battle the almighty subscribe button. Please, if you like what you've seen so far, please leave a like and consider subscribing. And now, seriously, let's get ready to fight the boss. fight Yagluth, you will first need to find him. The room with his location can be found near a structure like this, shown on screen. His location runestone is notoriously hard to find, so you might need to raid a few plains biomes before finding it. Once you have his location, you'll need five fueling totems to place at his altar. As seen previously, you can get these from fueling berserkers, in fueling villages, or in stone structures like these shown on screen. Yagluth is resistant to fire, pierce damage, and immune to poison and stagger. As a result, arrows and spears will not be much use here. I recommend grabbing Bone Mass's Forsaken Power and using the full padded armor for maximum damage reduction in either the Black Metal Sword or Frostnir for getting up close and personal. He also does a ton of fire damage, so I'd consider bringing some barley wine with you as well. As for food, I suggest leaning into health food for survivability, as it will be a long fight. Combine lox meat pie, fish wraps, and blood pudding for a good balance of stamina and health with an emphasis on health. Once defeated, he will drop the Torn Spirit and Yagluth Trophy. The Torn Spirit enables you to build the Wisp Fountain, which is critical as you now turn your focus towards the Mistlands. Lastly, take Yagluth's Trophy back to the Sacrificial Stones to obtain Yagluth's Forsaken Power. His power gives you 50% resistance to fire, frost, and lightning damage for 5 minutes for you and nearby players. Inside this box is an item critical to your progression in the Mistlands, but beware, you will not get it without a fight. Wait, you'll regret this. Oh, they're, they're, oh, they're no, going on me. Oh, God. Damn it. Inside is what I consider to be one of the three key pillars for progression in the Mistland. Stick with me as I capture the first pillar by navigating these giant skeletal remains, the second by exploring the Mistland's dungeons, and thirdly by breaking open the secret box. First, let's discuss how to find and ultimately prepare for the Mistlands. To find the Mistlands, sail far east or west until you spot dark, jutting rocks and dense fog. As you enter, you will quickly notice visibility in the Mistlands is next to zero. To enable sight in the dense mist, you will need the Torn Spirit drop from defeating Yaglu. With the Spirit in hand, craft and place the Wisp Fountain and wait for nightfall. At night, Wisps will spawn around the fountain every 30 seconds or so. Interact with the floating blue Wisps to add them to your inventory. Craft and equip the Wisp Light to maintain a floating Wisp above your head to light your way through the mist. Unfortunately, it takes the place of other wearable items like the Measuring Jord Bell or wishbone. With a light source, we can turn our attention towards the enemies in the mistlands. As they are very strong, we will have to choose our armor and weapons carefully. For armor, you cannot go wrong with the highest armor value in the padded set, but I would strongly recommend you replace the padded cuirass with the root harness chest plate. Pierce damage is the predominant physical damage in this biome, so the harness will really shine. Alternatively, if you are a speed demon like myself, you can simply rock the full Fenris gear. In both cases, I strongly recommend you bring barley wine with you for fire resistance. As for weapons, pierce damage is the most common weakness of creatures in this biome, so I recommend the black metal act gear or the frost near for that sweet elemental damage. Plus, the slowing effect caused by the freezing gives you much more time to outmaneuver your foes. You will also need a bow to tackle creatures in the sky and to generally keep your distance. Either the Draugr Fang or Huntsman bows will do just fine. And finally, the Mistlands has countless stamina draining cliffs, so certainly get your rested bonus and consider bringing some stamina or tasty meats to help you out in a pinch. Now that we are properly prepared, it's time for us to begin our journey to uncover the three pillars of progression and most importantly, discover the contents of the box. The first creature you will encounter are the sweet, gentle, and passive hares, often found hopping around low-lying areas of the biome. However, do not let the hares lull you into 
false safety. The mistlands are filled with violence, as you will soon see. That said, you should hunt the hares for their meat and hide, of which will be used in fantastic endgame food recipes and armor, respectively. Other passive creatures are the Dvager, which can be found near various structures, such as guard towers, lighthouses near the water, excavation sites, but what are they excavating anyways? Or in harbors. Within these structures is where you will find the secret boxes. More on the Dvager, their excavations, and of course, the secret within the box later in the video. Unlike the Hare and Vager, the most common aggressive creatures are the Seekers and Seeker Soldiers, both of which are resistant to all physical damage and immune to spirit, making them a pain in the butt fight. Seekers also fly, so keep that in mind when you think high ground will save you. The Soldiers, on the other hand, cannot fly, but are absolute tanks that deal a ton of damage. Beware of their AoE stomping attack. Fortunately, they are weak in their butts, with almost all damage, so if you can get behind them, you can kill them quickly. The Frostner really comes in handy here, allowing you to slow them and maneuver to their rear. Once defeated, the Seeker and Soldier will drop Carapace, Seeker Meat, their trophies, and the Soldier has a chance to drop a Mandible. These items will contribute to both endgame weapons, armor, and foods, all of which I will cover in full detail later in this video. Speaking of foods, the Mistlands Wilderness introduces two new farmable crops in the Mage Caps and Jotun Puffs. Mage Caps are blue mushrooms found at the peak of jagged rocks in the biome and form the basis of Eiter generating foods. Eiter is Valheim's version of mana, required for spell casting which is an absolute blast to use. Jotun Puffs, on the other hand, are found in low-lying areas of the biome and will be foundational in recipes for endgame foods and meats. Both crops can only grow in the Mistlands, so mentally prepare to establish a farm in this treacherous biome. When building your farm, remember you can use your excess wisps from the fountain we built at the beginning to build wisp torches. Unlike other torches, these never burn out and therefore provide a permanent fixture of mist clearing light. Before we get to the most dangerous foe in the Mistlands, you may have noticed on your adventures Yggdrasil shoots, ancient armor, swords, or skeletal remains. The Yggdrasil shoots are the native wood source of the biome, which will require a black metal axe to chop down. This wood is the backbone for endgame weapons and built structures like the black metal pickaxe, which we can use to mine the ancient swords and armor. These provide you with additional access to copper scrap and scrap iron, which can be smelted to iron and copper, respectively. Thirdly, and most importantly, are the giant remains. These are large skeletons composed of black marble. The marble mined from the remains can be used as a strong building material and an ingredient in the Mistlands crafting stations. However, these are often protected by nasty ticks. Ticks are unlike any other enemy in Valheim and will seek to attach themselves to you. If one sticks, it will continuously drain your health with rapid pierce damage. If you heeded my advice and wore the root harness, you can thank me later. The best way I have found to get them off once attached is to simply roll. That said, once popped, ticks will drop blood clots which will be key in the the crafting of magic wielding weapons and foods. On the bright side, the presence of ticks means there is soft tissue nearby. Take your black metal pickaxe, find the skull of the giant remains, and hack away. Once you break the skull, you'll find soft tissue inside. The soft tissue is the first of our three pillars of progression for the Mistlands. Second, we will find in the dungeons, but first, we must face the most fearsome of creatures this biome has to offer in the Yalls. Yalls are giant floating, blimp-like creatures that you will likely hear before you even see them, if you are lucky. The more likely outcome is you will be introduced to them with a fireball to the face. Oh, what was that? I think I'm dead. I'm, t I'm dead. Fortunately, their underbellies are weak to pierce damage, so arrows will excel here. In addition to their fireball, they will drop a raiding party of ticks. Clean them up quickly or face the Yal's wrath. Once defeated, they will drop the bile bag, providing the recipe for a unique axe and a new type of tossable weapon in the bile bomb. With the Yal defeated, it's time to capture the second pillar of progression in the Mistlands infested mines. The mines can be found in the basement of ruined black marble buildings or at the peak of marble staircases embedded in a cliff face. In my experience, these are often found on the coast of the biome. Inside, expect close combat with several rooms separated by wooden barricades. Move through the dungeon slowly, clearing a room before breaking into the next. You will find familiar enemies inside in the Seeker, Seeker Soldier, Hicks, in addition to Seeker Broods. Seeker Broods are baby Seekers that are easy to kill. They will drop royal jelly or pick it from piles within the dungeon. The jelly will primarily be used in recipes for Eiter generating foods, which we will cover shortly. Scattered across the dungeon, you will be able to get black marble, wood, and even certain cores and copper scraps from destroying 
Vagar lanterns. However, the major loot is found in the hidden treasure rooms. Treasure rooms are found behind false walls as indicated by blue writing on the wall. Once open, you will find chests, and if you are lucky, black cores and seal breaker fragments. You must break the fragments case to acquire this item. I will cover the purpose behind these fragments as we turn our attention towards the biome's boss. The black cores, however, are our second pillar of progression. Black cores give us the recipe for the two Mistlands crafting tables and refinery in the Black Forge, Galder Table, and Eiter Refinery. In total, you will need 15 black cores to build all three. A black core is not guaranteed within any given infested mine, so be prepared to explore several of these. Your first craft should be the Black Forge and its upgrade structures in the Black Forge Cooler and Vice, which will allow you to craft the Carapace Heavy Armor Set and a suite of new weapons. Included is an all new class in the Arvalus Crossbow, and two new shields amongst other things. One other weapon I do want to highlight is the Mist Walker. When crafted, it provides a source of light to assist in dispersing the mist in the Mistland. I've included a summary of the armor, weapons, shields, and their associated costs here on screen, so feel free to pause here to digest the information. One thing you will notice is that the max quality of all weapons and armor is currently capped at 3. The fourth quality level will not be available until the Ashlands release later this year. Secondly, the Galder table and its upgrade structures in the Rune table and Unfading Candles will allow you to craft the all new Eiterweave armor set and a suite of magic casting staffs and an absolute busted feather cape. You will never take this thing off. More on this item a little later. Magic is an absolute blast to use and I encourage you to experiment with using all of the four staffs and even try combining them. I've summarized the full list of craftable items at the Galder table and their costs. While reviewing these, you will likely have noticed a couple ingredients I have not yet mentioned in Sap and Refined Eiter. Let me explain. Refined Eiter is made by combining Sap and Soft Tissue at the Eiter Refinery. However, to enable this refining, we will have to revisit our Devager friends and finally open the box for our third pillar of progression. The Devager component crate can be found in either guard towers, lighthouses, excavation sites, or harbors as described earlier. Once found, fortunately for us, Vagers are friendly and we can simply crack these open and carry on. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Psych, just kidding. If you damage any structure within the radius of one of their wards, every Dvager within the vicinity will immediately become aggressive towards you, and they do not mess around. The Dvager take a few different forms. First is the Rogue, wielding a crossbow and dealing pierce damage, and second are the Mages, which can come in three forms. First are Blue Frost Mages that do frost and blunt damage. Second are Red Fire Mages doing fire and blunt damage. And third are Yellow Support Mages, which summon homing orbs, plus they can heal their allies with an AoE heal. Killing any of the Dvagers will yield you coins, black marble, soft tissue, and potential for the Dvager trophy. Pro tip, break open crates as these are often filled with soft tissue. With the coast finally clear, you can safely destroy the Dvager component crate and receive the Dvager extractor. With the extractor, you will now be able to craft the sap extractor. Once crafted, place the extractor on one of the many ancient roots you will have seen scattered across the biome. As time passes, the extractor will pull sap from the root to a max capacity of 10. Return to the extractor for the third pillar of progression in the Mistlands in sap. The ancient roots, however, have three different statuses you should be made aware of. First, full, which displays a text of the ancient root is pulsating with energy, meaning it contains approximately 25 sap. Half dried, which displays a text of the ancient's root glow is fading, meaning it contains approximately 10 sap. And finally, dried up, which displays a text of the ancient root seems all dried up, meaning it is without sap. When dried up, move your extractor to a new ancient root to continue extracting. Fortunately, ancient roots are a renewable resource Source, and after a day or two, the original root will have refilled itself of sap once more. On my server, I generally alternate between two or three ancient roots near my base. With all three pillars in hand, you will now be able to combine sap and soft tissue into refined Eiter. You should know that the refining process of Eiter is volatile. While refining, Eiter will fly out, destroying nearby structures other than black marble. For this reason, I recommend building your refiner inside a black marble casing. With refined Eiter in hand, we may now begin crafting the weapons and armor that you you will need to take on the almighty final boss. First things first, review the full list of food recipes you will have now made available to you to ensure you are eating the best foods ahead of your showdown with the queen. As you can see from this table, the Mistlands added a new stat in addition to health and stamina in Eiter. Eiter is effectively mana and is required to cast spells. To gain Eiter for spellcasting, you must first eat one of the Eiter foods, the Seeker Aspic for instance. With that said, once fed, you'll need two things to summon her. First, her location. The queen resides inside the infested citadel. 
Place her on your map, you must first find her location runestone in one of the infested mines. Second, you'll need to have crafted the seal breaker. This can be crafted at the Galder table by combining nine seal breaker fragments. This will be used to open the doors into the queen's lair. Unlike all other bosses, you do not summon the queen first time you fight her, but rather as you enter her lair, she will be alive and roaming. If you want to fight her again, you may resummon her by sacrificing three seeker trophies at her hive seat. The inside of the infested citadel is a tall structure with a staircase leading up around the perimeter. As a result, it's easy to fall. The queen takes full advantage of the terrain with her attacks, doing a ton of knockback. For this reason, it's imperative you have the feather cape equipped for this fight as it completely eliminates fall damage. If you have not seen this item in action, check this out. You can essentially fly with this thing. I never take it off. Furthermore, she is resistant to pierce damage, effectively neutralizing foes, and is also immune to spirit damage. With all that said, I recommend one of two strategies for defeating her. One, melee while using the carapace armor, or two, with magic using the Eiter weave set. If choosing Using option 1, I recommend using the Krom or a polearm such as the Imanov. The Queen's high attack speed prevents sufficient time to complete the typical 3 attack combo of most melee weapons. For this reason, the Krom shines by forgoing the 3 attack combo in favor of high damage dealing secondary attack. The Imanov, on the other hand, is great at handling the adds summoned by the Queen throughout the fight in addition to great damage. Alternatively, magic provides you with the opportunity to maintain distance from the Queen by focusing her down with the Staff of Embers, as well as dealing with the adds of the AoE damage. Damage. The Staff of Frost 2 can also be used to keep adds off you at closer range. The staff of Protection and Dead Razor are less viable if playing solo as they consume health on use. That said, if with a party, the Staff of Protection can provide a protective bubble to allies. No matter the strategy you choose, Bowmass's Forsaken Power is a must and you should have both health and stamina potions on hand if in a pinch. Lastly, poison resistance should be popped ahead of the fight as the queen can rack up the poison damage. Once defeated, the queen will drop her trophy and the queen drop. While the queen drop is a generic placeholder item that currently serves no purpose, you should take the trophy back to the sacrificial stones. Mount it on her corresponding stone to unlock her power, providing increased damage to rocks by 60% and increased item regeneration by 100% in 5 minutes. This will be a must-have choice for those miners and spellcasters out there. And with the Queen defeated, you can join me in the Ashlands waiting room. And before you go, consider joining our community Discord, link in the description below.